TorahCafe.com. One of the things that I'd like to talk about is what is the history of Islam? How does Judaism see this faith? And is there any insight into God's plan for the world in this religion's development? So first, the word Islam means submission, meaning submission to God's will. That's what the word means in Arabic. Islam, Islam the religion, emerged rapidly in the 7th century, among various nomadic Arab tribes, making it, being that's the seventh century, makes it the youngest of the world's five major religions. I'm sure most people in the room know who's the founder of Islam. It's Muhammad, right? So Muhammad was an orphaned Bedouin merchant who lived in Mecca, and he united many separate Arab tribes in a shared belief in one common supreme deity. And in Islam, that deity is known as Allah. Allah just means God, the generic term for God in Arabic. So if you want to say God in Arabic, it's Allah. Muhammad claimed to be a descendant of Abraham through his son Ishmael. Now, in the Bible, in the Torah, we read that Abraham and Sarah, his wife, could not conceive of children, could not have children for a while. And during that time, Abraham took a concubine and had a child with her, uh, and his name was Ishmael. Ishmael. He was not um, the most well-behaved child, and eventually Sarah had instructed Abraham that they should be uh, left to their own devices, that they should leave the house. And essentially, Judaism is passed on through the child that Abraham and Sarah eventually have together, named Isaac. Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, uh, and so forth. So Muhammad, who lives approximately 2,000 years after Abraham, claims to be his descendant through his son uh, Ishmael. Okay? And typically in Jewish tradition, uh, Ishmael is considered the father of all of the Arab peoples, all the Arab nations. So Muhammad claims that he is a descendant of Abraham through Ishmael. He claims that he doesn't want to abrogate the Hebrew scriptures or, for that matter, the Gospels. Remember, we're talking 7th century, so we're still we're a few hundred years after Christianity uh, had already uh, taken root as well. So he says that he doesn't want, he's not coming to abrogate the, the Torah. He's not coming to abrogate the Gospels. He's coming to as sort of the fulfillment of all of it. So from the age of 40, he claims that he starts receiving these divine revelations from the angel Gabriel. He would go down in what appeared to be an epileptic fit, and when he would come up, he would have these tales of visions and messages that he had received from this angel. And these messages were recorded in what were called surahs, and these surahs eventually were said publicly. And all the collection of these teachings were compiled into what we know today as the Quran. The Quran means to recite because there were, these teachings were meant to be recited. Now, being that Muhammad was not coming to abrogate the Jewish scriptures or the Gospels, so he thought that the Jews and the Christians would be very embracing of him and his teachings. That wasn't necessarily the case. And so although he accepted, although, although Muhammad accepted most of the Bible and most of the, uh, the stories, the, uh, the, the history that, that was contained within it, what he said was that he accused the Jews of deleting sections that referred to him, that were sort of uh, prophecies or foretelling of the establishment of Islam, that we changed it. So being that initially it, wasn't, it didn't get off the ground as, as quickly and as easily as uh, he had, in, uh, had imagined, so Muhammad and his followers successfully established a new faith through conversion and conquest against all those who stood against them. And this trend actually continued 
long after uh, um, the passing of Muhammad. So the, the, next, the next idea I want to just talk about a little bit is what is it that Muslims believe? What, what, what is the basis of Islam? And so to do that, we're not going to open our Quran. What we're going to do is we're going to examine a, a key text in Jewish philosophy. There, there was a book written by Rabbi Yehuda Halevi in the 12th century. It's called the Kuzari. Now, back in those days, people were interested in philosophy. Whatever philosophy was around. Today, people are interested in, in sports, or they're interested in politics, or they're interested in Hollywood, what's going on. When people are into things and are looking for a, you know, an outlet in life, these are the things that people get into today. Back in those days, I guess they were more... Uh, you know, intellectual or whatever. So their, their focus was philosophy. They liked learning Greek philosophy. They liked learning Christianity. Islam in the 12th century, that was like a good time, was let's learn some, some philosophy. So a lot of Jews in particular who had got caught up in this or were learning other, other philosophies, a lot of them had a confused or skewed view of Jewish belief. So many of the early sages who lived in the medieval times, wrote philosophical works that clarified what the Jewish perspective is on our own faith, on our own religion, on God, on world outlook, on purpose and afterlife, and all the things that are contained within our faith. So Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, in the 12th century, compiles this book called the Kuzari. And one of the reasons that it's stayed such a classic is because of its unique style. Basically, the way that he did it was he made it almost in like a story format where you had this fictional king of the Khazars, okay? and, uh, this, which, took place, the, the, which took place in current where Turkey or Bulgaria would be today. And the king of the Khazars keeps having this recurring dream that he needs to repent and he has to get his life in line. And what he does is he starts interviewing philosophers from three major religious groups, Islam, Christianity, and eventually Judaism. And through all of the discussion and the interviews that he has with these philosophers, he finally determines for himself that Judaism is the path that he'd like to embark on. But through the work, through this sort of uh, philosophy constructed in the format of a story, we get a very clear glimpse of what other faiths believe. And so I'd like to read to you uh, just briefly what it says in the Kuzari. What is it that Muslims believe. This is what the Islamic philosopher said in the Kuzari. It says, Muslims believe in one God. They believe that God created the world and mankind comes from Adam. Sounds pretty familiar so far. They further believe that the Quran is the holy word of God and that the wondrous text itself proves this. No mortal could ever write such a book. So the reason that they, they accept the Quran as authoritative is because it's so well written. In its original Arabic, it, the, just the, the text itself is so clear that it proves that it can only be divine. Muslims believe that the Prophet Muhammad is the last of the prophets and that his teachings supersede all doctrine that preceded him. Everyone should convert to Islam in order to enjoy paradise, where he is rewarded with delicious food, drinks, and uh, other frills. However, those who refuse to convert to Islam will be doomed to burn in an everlasting fire. This is just a glimpse of what was said uh, in the Kuzari. Um, I, I'd like to discuss for just a few moments to, to, to break all of that down, some of the fundamental tenets of Islam. Islam is built on two things. Iman, which is religious belief, like emuna, iman, religious belief, and din, religious belief. Uh, practice. So the principles of faith that they believe that they, hold, that they hold dear is belief in God, belief in his angels, in his scriptures, in his prophets, in the last day, and the predetermination of good and evil. And each Muslim has five religious duties. One is the shahada, which is the affirmation that there is only one God, and then there's no God but Allah, and that Muhammad is his, is his messenger, the observance of prayer daily, giving zakah, charity, a pilgrimage to Mecca, 
and fasting during Ramadan. Let's talk about each one of those briefly. What does it mean? What is it, what is it all about? First of all, the unity of God is, is a central point in Islam, similar to the way that Jews believe in the oneness and unity of God, meaning that we have no physical depiction, that God doesn't have a shape, it doesn't have a nose, that he's one infinite, invisible being. That's the way that Muslims regard God is similar to the way that Jews regard God as one eternal, merciful, compassionate, almighty, all-knowing, just, and forgiving God. Like Judaism, they also don't believe that there's any mediators necessary to get to God. You don't need to speak to anybody else in order to uh, pray to God or to worship God. They also believe in personal responsibility for action and the eternal nature of the soul. In mosques, you will not find any images at all. The only thing that you'll find close would be words from the Quran, not images, because Anything that's an image takes away from what's, what's real. And just like in, in Judaism, we don't depict God or, or in, in some senses, uh, creations in, in certain ways. Uh, in Islam, it's not even in the, in the form of pictures in the, in the mosque. Prayer. In Judaism, how many times a day do we pray? Three. How many times do uh, Muslims pray every day? Five times a day, that's right. Every Muslim is required to pray five times every single day. And one thing, another that's, uh, that's also similar about the prayer service that they hold is in some faith traditions, so you have a clergy member who's sort of uh, head and shoulder above the rest, more holy, and you ha your prayers have to be done by him, this officiated uh, entity. But in Judaism and also in Islam, any person of good character, good moral character and conduct who's learned um, can lead the prayer service. You don't have to be a clergyman uh, per se, just a learned individual who is of upstanding moral uh, character. So Jews pray three times a day, Muslims pray uh, five times a day. Charles C. Torrey, who was a professor of Semitic language at Yale in the beginning of the 20th century, said that the reason that they chose to pray five times a day was in order to surpass the Jews in devotion. He writes also that this practice of praying five times a day was not even necessarily established by Muhammad. Even in Jewish tradition, we have uh, some of our rabbis, our authorities, who comment on why Muslims decided to take on five, uh, five prayer services. Is there a time on the Jewish calendar that we as Jews do pray more than three times a day? Yom Kippur. Right, on Shabbat and Yom Tov, and on Rosh Chodesh, we have four times. We add Musaf, which, is the, which would be the fourth prayer. But the only day a year that we had five prayer services is the holy day of, of Yom Kippur. And on Yom Kippur, we pray five times a day. So what's, what's, what's interesting is that Rabbi Shimon Doran, who was known as the Rashbats, or the Tashbats, who was a famous rabbinic scholar in Algiers in the 1400s, says that the custom of Muslims to pray five times a day was in order to emulate Yom Kippur. Meaning the Jews only reached this connection with God once a year, we have it every single day. Additionally, by Muslims, anyone who has been to certain locations in Israel or to other Islamic countries um, will, may have heard the call to prayer. That from the tower, there's someone who is like a, a crier who announces that the time for prayer has arrived and you can hear it all over the city. Some people want to trace this practice of announcing the prayer and that it going out to everybody to a Jewish practice that's mentioned in the Talmud, it's the Gemara in Yuma, that says that there was a crier who would announce that uh, the service was about to start. He would say, arise priest to your service, Levites to your platform, and Israelites to your stands and his voice could be heard to up to three miles away. Another pillar of faith in Islam that we did, excuse me, another pillar of religious practice that we mentioned earlier is the concept of Hajj, which is the pilgrimage, that every Muslim has to make a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in their lifetime, unless the person is physically or financially unable to do so. And the idea even of a pilgrimage 
is very rooted in Jewish tradition, uh, which requires that the Israelites make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times a year on our uh, major holidays. Why is, the set, why is the center in Islam around Mecca? Well, number one, Mecca is the birthplace of Muhammad, and it's the place where he is said to have his first revelation of the Quran. Um, and the center, of, the center of their religion over there, in, 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 it's Mecca's in Saudi Arabia, is a building called the Kaaba, which, is, um, which they claim was built or added onto by Abraham and Ishmael. So it's the center of their worship. All center of, of worship in Islam is directed over there. And every person uh, around the world who is of the Muslim faith, when they pray five times a day, they direct their prayers in that direction. And the last thing uh, that's, that is part of their um, religious practice is the fasting during Ramadan. What many people don't realize, it's a very interesting fact, that Muhammad originally accepted the Day of Atonement. What's our Day of Atonement? Yom Kippur, right? He originally accepted the Day of Atonement as a fast day. It was known as Ashura, which means the fast of the 10th. When is Yom Kippur fall? The 10th of the Hebrew month of Tishrei. Right? Every year it falls on the 10th of Tishrei. Ashura, the 10th, the fast of the 10th, was uh, celebrated as a as a as a Islamic fast day, right by Muhammad. Um, only later, when Muhammad sought to distance himself from Judaism, was it changed to a month long period of fasting, prayer, introspection, and making amends. One of the things that's that's interesting and sort of ties well with Judaism is that in Judaism we have built into our system from the beginning of Rosh Chodesh Elul, the first day of Elul, which is the month that precedes Rosh Hashanah, until 40 days later of Yom Kippur, this is a 40-day uh, time, a 40-day period in Judaism of fasting, introspection, um, making amends, prayer, that um, very much uh, that, that uh, Muslims also seem to have borrowed in creating Ramadan, having, having a, a center of atonement uh, with, with a with a month period or so surrounding it, to, devoted to prayer and uh, making amends with oneself and uh, fellows and God. There's, when, we, when, we, when we live in America, as Americans, we, we tend to think, you know, what faith tradition is, is most similar to ours? What's the first thing that we, we mostly assume is, is most like Judaism? Christianity. Christianity. You know, our, being that we live in a Christian nation, we, we usually assume that Christianity is the faith that resembles Judaism the most, where, where in, in some ways that might not necessarily be so. Um, in some ways, Islam um, resembles Judaism much more than Christianity in certain ways. Uh, they have an oral tradition. They have discussion of Islamic law, details and, and, and specifics, and some of their laws are even similar to, to our laws. We know where they got them from, but the, the, the point is that, that the, the whole system of the construct of their religion and how they assess things uh, resembles uh, the way that Jews assess things as well. The great names, the pillars of their faith, the, the, uh, the, the heroes of their religion are people that we all know, uh, we know uh, very well. In, in the Quran, you'll find Adam, you'll find Noah, Abraham, Ishmael, Lot, um, Joseph, Saul, David, Solomon, Elijah, Job, Jonah, and Moses. You find them all. Okay? They're all mentioned in the Quran, as are the stories of the fall of uh, Adam and the, uh, the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, the Quran's account of creation, life in paradise, the question of what came first, heaven or earth, the objection of the angels in the creation of Adam, uh, Adam's remarkable wisdom, Adam and Eve in the garden, Adam's universal lesson of repentance, all are clearly culled from Torah and our Midrashim. Likewise, all the stories about Israel's covenant with God and the travails in Egypt and the miracles of the Red Sea and the making of the golden calf and the pillar of the cloud and the manna and the quails and Moses hitting the rock and the objection to the taste of manna and the giving of the Torah by raising a mountain over the Jews' heads and the red heifer are all obvious adaptations from the entire spectrum of Jewish tradition. Yet they claim that we, we took it from them, obviously, 1,500 years later. 
you have to do some pretty creative mental gymnastics to, to claim that we copied you 1,500 years after all of it, whatever. So these five pillars that we discussed make up Islam for between 80 and 85% of worldwide Muslims. They're called, they're named Sunni Muslims. After Muhammad passed away, so there was a dispute exactly as how to proceed as far as leadership. So the dispute be mainly began as a, more of like a political dispute, how to proceed politically, who should be leaders and whatnot. But as time progressed, these political differences took on also theological differences as well. So 15 to 20 percent of uh, the Muslim population in the world are Shia Muslims who add three more principles to their faith, one of which is jihad. Now, we're not going to we're not going to discuss this as a as a as a main topic. Just just to mention sort of peripherally that jihad, even the way that it's depicted today on the news and and by certain groups, is not even that is not the the uh, primary way that jihad has been assessed and done uh, in in the in the mind of of Muslims. Uh, for for the past centuries, there are officially laws and, and practices that go into making an official jihad. It's not just oh we we don't like these people. Let's start uh, randomly killing people. Even in those who even in those Muslims who believe in jihad and and, and uh, there there are certain uh, parameters officially as part of their faith that are meant to be um, locked into place before uh, jihad can be done. So. W not to justify any of it, but just but but perhaps some of the things that we see on the news is is uh, is a is a, is a fringe element, unfortunately, that has uh, really um, given a bad name to the entire Islamic faith. How does Jewish law view Islamic? And we'll mention also just because we're talking about it. How does it? How does it Jew view? Um, the Islamic faith and the Christian faith. What well, was talking about it anyway? So the first thing that we have to know is that Judaism abhors idolatry and paganism. You know, before 2,000 years ago, before the onset of Christianity, you had the worst of the worst scenarios in people's beliefs. People believe in all sorts of gods, but uh, uh, accompanying that, Accompanying the, the, the belief in multiple gods was a whole culture dedicated to the worst things that this planet has ever seen. Killing, immorality, sac human sacrifices, crazy, crazy things. It was a crazy, crazy world. You had to be suspect of so many different things that, thank God, in our world, in, in, in modern times and in modern countries, that we don't have to be as concerned about. So Judaism abhors idolatry and paganism because of all just aside from the fact that it's worshiping the wrong god just because complete with that that culture comes all sorts of terrible practices as part of the mainstream focus of their faith so in fact judaism abhors idolatry so much that it's one of the three things that if a jew is presented it, we have to give up our life for it in other words for a Jew, if somebody puts a gun to your head and says, violate the Sabbath, we're technically allowed to do that because you save a life, you save your life. If, 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 if somebody's presented a gun to their head, eat a cheeseburger, it's not kosher, you're allowed to do it because you save your life. But if somebody says, told them, someone holds the gun to a Jew's head and says, worship an idol, bow down to this idol, the Jew's supposed to let his life be taken, bite the bullet. So that's how much idolatry is abhorred. It, it completely contradicts everything that a Jew stands for. In fact, the Talmud dedicates an entire volume to how we deal with idols and idol worshippers. So where does Islam fall in that category? How did the sages view that faith? So this dilemma, this idea, was, was discussed by Maimonides, the Rambam, the famed medieval sage, and he, was, he, he talks about it in his responsa literature, and it's in response to a person named Ovadia. Ovadia was a, a, a Muslim who had converted to Judaism. 
And when he was learning uh, in a yeshiva environment, he was learning from a rabbi, and the rabbi was giving him a hard time about his past, saying that Muslims were idol worshippers and sort of making fun of him for his, for his past. And so Avadya corresponds with the Rambam. It says, is that really my past? Should, the, is, is, should I feel guilty about that? Am I an idol worshipper? And so the Rambam writes back very clearly that Islam is not considered idolatry. Here's what he says. He says, the Ishmaelites, Muslims, are not idol worshippers at all. All idolatry has ceased to exist from their mouths and hearts, and they attribute the proper oneness to God with no blemish. And if someone will say that the house that they worship in is an idolatrous shrine, the Kaaba in, in Saudi Arabia, which before the onset of Islam was used in, in uh, pagan worship, if someone will say that those who pray there are worshiping in an idolatrous shrine as their ancestors worshipped idols there. This does not matter because those who go there today and bow there today have their hearts dedicated to heaven towards God. And the Ishmaelites today, all of them, men, women, and children, have ceased to believe in idolatry. There are mistakes in other things. However, in attributing oneness to God, they have no mistake at all. Full-on monotheism. So Islam seemed to have a, a very special... Uh, a unique standing in Jewish tradition as far as from a theological point of view. We could talk for a second, you know, how would that apply to walking into a mosque, going into a mosque? Our Mishnah in Judaism, the Mishnah teaches that a Jew is forbidden from entering a place where worship is theologically contrary to Judaism. So how would that go with, with Islam? So some rabbis... Some sages hold that even though Islam is not an idolatrous religion, it's still forbidden to enter a mosque because it's a place where Muslims invoke and glorify the name of Muhammad and read publicly from portions of the Quran which suggest that the Torah is not true. Um, so according to those authorities, according to those sages, one would not be able to enter into a mosque. However, the vast majority of sages have determined that mosques are not problematic to enter from a theological, uh, for theological reasons. And this is dealt with actually extensively in the responsa literature of Rabbi Avadi Yosef, former chief Sephardic rabbi of Israel. In fact, in the 19th century, Rabbi Yitzchak, Yitzchak Elchanan Specter, who was a respected sage at the time, was posed a question by a certain group of Jewish soldiers that had fought in Russia against the Turks. So after they conquered an important city, the Jewish soldiers asked if they could have a place where they could pray. And the authorities gave them a mosque to use. And they, they asked Rabbi Specter, is it appropriate that we, that we can use this as a mosque, that we can use this as a synagogue? It's a mosque, after all. And so he responded once again, Muslims are not idol worshippers. It's clear and simple that one could make a permanent synagogue out of a mosque that was given to you by the authorities. In this regard, Christianity would be a bit more problematic at least according to the, the Rambam's perspective. Because, again, there's many different sects of Christianity, and so it's difficult to make sweeping statements. But the doctrine of the Trinity is much more theologically problematic for a Jew, and therefore a Jew entering a church would be more restrictive than a Jew entering a mosque. Again, as far as practical application of all this, and how and when and how and why to use it, um, it's, consult your local... Rabbi, but as far as just uh, in, in theoretical terms, it would be uh, in theory more problematic. The Rambam, Maimonides, again, although he views Islam as monotheistic, and in this regard sound with Judaism, he has another responsa that seems to imply the opposite. There's a discussion in one of his one of his letters that addressed the topic of teaching Torah to non-Jews. Is it appropriate? When is it appropriate? How is it appropriate? And so the Rambam writes that one is allowed to teach the Christians Torah, but should refrain from teaching Muslims. And so that seems to contradict everything that he's sort of said until now. What we said until now is that Islam is monotheistic. Islam is, is very in sync with Judaism. And, and Christianity has a more... Uh, a, a, a more diverse view of God than, than Judaism does. But over here we're saying that 
if you're teaching, you should teach the Christians and, and not as much with the, with the Muslims. At the end of the day, the reason is, is that Islam and Christianity, according to the sages, are, are seen as uh, uh, sort of breakaway faiths that each contain within them half the truth of the Torah. Meaning Islam has a very clear view of God, but rejects the divinity of the Torah. Whereas Christianity has a very clear uh, acceptance of the divinity of the Torah, but has a, 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 a different view of, of God and the Godhead. The Trinity is, is antithetical to, to Jewish thought. So, where does it all fit in God's plan? Why, you know, if we look at the sheer numbers of the world, Christi Christianity is in the billions. Islam is in the billions. Why, why did God sort of have these faiths spring up? How does it fit in the, in the overall divine picture of, of, where, of where we're heading and where, where it's, what's, what's doing? So the Rambam, Maimonides, actually says a, something very fascinating. He says that God allowed Christianity and Islam to take hold in the world to spread the basic concepts of Torah to the nations of the world. Meaning before Christianity, it was all paganism. It was either Jews who were monotheistic or the vast majority who were complete uh, pagans, not only worshipping idols, but again, engaged in the most depraved practices that the planet has ever seen as part of their mainstream belief. When Christianity and Islam came to the scene, both eliminated the depraved pagan behaviors that were going on before and introduced the world to a, a version of God and Torah values. So all of, this, all of this explains the Rambam is ultimately to prepare the world for the Messiah and the Messianic era when it comes. Meaning that the, whatever bits of truth, whatever bits of Torah have been spread worldwide through these major faith systems, it paves the way that when Mashiach will come, Messianic era will come, that the rest of the world will have already been familiarized with certain basic tenets, certain basic concepts. Rabbi Yaakov Emden also says in his commentary to Perkei Avos, says that the Christians and the Muslims are key instruments in fulfilling the prophecy that when, Messiah, when the Messiah will come, that the knowledge of God will be spread through the earth as the water covers the seabed. One thing that, that sort of separates Judaism from other faith groups is that Judaism does not proselytize. Many other faith groups believe it's our way or the highway. You know, we are the key, the key element. We are the only way to God. Everyone else is wrong and damned. But Judaism does not proselytize. And the reason that we don't proselytize is that we believe that not only Jews have a place and a purpose in this world, but everybody in the entire, the entire human family has a place in this world, has a key role to play in perfecting the world. Jews have to do it through Torah, through our 613 mitzvahs, our commandments. And non-Jews have seven specific commandments that were given to Noah after the flood, and all of humanity is a descendant of Noah, that were given to Noah after the flood. And if they uphold those seven laws, God says, thumbs up, great job. You've done your purpose, and you will have a share in the world to come. So there's no need for Jews to go out and proselytize and say, be like us, you have to be like us, we are the only way. Instead, we can say, if you follow your seven laws, if you follow those seven, those seven key codes in, in, in living an upstanding moral life, God is perfectly happy with you, and we love you. What are those seven laws? Number one is to believe in God, not to worship idols. Number two is not to curse God. Number three is to not murder. Four is not to steal. Five is uh, not to commit certain uh, illicit relationships. Six is not to be cruel to animals and eat the limb of a living animal. And seven is to uphold, uh, make courts of justice that will uphold the other six. So meaning when, when an issue comes up, to vote for those things and, and support, make court systems that enforce 
the other six laws. And any of the non-Jewish nations that accept those laws, or any person who's not of the Jewish faith who accepts those laws and does them because this is what God wants for me in the world, has a place in the world to come. Is considered as fulfilling their purpose and doing what they need to do. And uh, we love them, God loves them, no need to proselytize anybody. The prophet Isaiah refers to the Jewish people as a light to the nations. He says over here, Nations shall walk in your light and kings in your shining brilliance. This is Isaiah. It's in the Mitzudas David comments on this verse. He says, They will learn God's ways from you and you will enlighten them. You know, a lot of times when we talk about Jewish pride, we, we, we associate it with things that really maybe shouldn't be Jewish pride. We, we get Jewish pride when there's a, an actor or a politician who's Jewish or a sports player who's Jewish. Like, wow, Jewish pride! But I think perhaps Jewish pride is more, more effectively and more truly shown in being proud of being part of God's light unto the nations, being a special part of this priestly people who are the disseminators of light around the world. It's said in the name of the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, that when the Noahide laws were given to the nations of the world, that the Jewish people agreed to become mentors for the rest of the world, meaning that we would shine, we would shine light, we'd be a good influence, and we would encourage everybody to be moral people and help us and help serve God all together in one unity, one united voice. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, one of the, uh, a, a key Hasidic Rebbe, in his Sefer Hamidah, says that when the Jewish people don't make godliness known to the nations of the world, when we're not spreading our light, this creates a vacuum. You know, the world is supposed to be filled with light, and we are supposed to be the disseminators of light. And when we don't fill the world with light, there's a vacuum created and room for other ideologies and philosophies to make their way sweeping across the globe. As a result, the nations introduce, uh, introduce many ideologies that are contrary to Torah and contrary to, to light, oftentimes. So by us shining light, by us being living examples of what Torah represents, of what Judaism represents, the rest of the world will follow suit and be influenced by that as well. People often ask, you know, what can I do at home? You know, polit political, co political connections and, and, and fighting politically is, is good and, 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 the, and the work is, is special work that you do and it's certainly necessary and, you know, we all, we all certainly thank you. Certainly everyone in Israel and all the Jewish people around the world, thank you for all the work that you guys do. Yet at the same time, we have to remember on a personal sphere of our own life that the key to affecting our surroundings and the key to changing the world is to be an active, added light. You know, when you see a person who's, who is a light, who's just a glow, living, living the way that they're supposed to be, very happy, very content, enthusiastic about Judaism, enthusiastic about God, not a Bible thumper, but just happy to be alive and, sh and spreading that light and spreading goodness to all, all their surroundings. So people who are nearby say, wow, that person's a light. I want some of that in my life. And you illuminate that person, and that person will, will also be a light and will illuminate the, the following person. And before you know it, you'll be illuminating the entire community Everything starts at home. So we all, you know, we have to think of, of ways in our own life. We're approaching the, the high holidays, time where we as, as Jews are, are looking to, you know, sort of hit the refresh, but, hit the refresh button and, and think about how we can make good changes in our life. And, and we have to think of areas in our life. Where can I add a little bit of light? Where can I implant a little extra light in my life and help shine that light to my surroundings. And when we stand strong as Jews, representing Torah, the nations are affected positively. I'd like to close with a, a general perspective that was offered by Rabbi Joseph Ber Soloveitchik before uh, the Ne'ila prayers of Yom Kippur. Ne'ila is at the, the end of the day of Yom Kippur. And during the Mincha service, of Yom Kippur, we read 
the book of Jonah. It's the only time of the year that we, we read it publicly. And in that, that's, that's a story about um, inhabitants of an, uh, of an Assyrian city. And the Assyrian city was not Jewish and not a friend of the Jewish people either. But yet the story recounts how, how Jonah went and, and, and warned them of impending doom and that they, they should mend their ways. And they did, and they, they repent, and they, they come back, and they, and they do what they need to do. And they are saved from, from calamity. So I'd like to quote what the Rav, uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik, says. Um, he, he, says he said this uh, before Ne'ilah. He says, as Ne'ilah approaches, we're standing in Yom Kippur, we remember that the Jews are not alone. We recount a tale of teshuva, of repentance, of return, not of an Israelite tribe, not of a Jewish tribe, but of an Assyrian city whose population actually harbored hatred for Israel. Yet the gates of repentance are always open for all people, Jew and non-Jew alike. And the entire world needs teshuva. The entire world needs to repent, to return, to get back in line, to make amends. The motif of the Zichroino section recited in the Musaf of Rosh Hashanah reflects this theme of universal teshuva. On Yom Kippur, we begin, by, we begin by praying for Israel alone, but towards the end of the day, we include the rest of humanity as well. This is the proper Jewish approach towards the non-Jewish nations. We must maintain our uniqueness, yet at the same time, not forget the non-Jew. On Yom Kippur, we pray not only for our own atonement, but for the atonement of mankind as well. So may we all merit that even before Rosh Hashanah, we receive the teshuva, the repentance, the return, the amends of the entire world and the beginning of the messianic era where Jews, Muslims, Christians, and everyone else will strive to serve God in one voice and everlasting peace. Thank you.